In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, we continue our journey, 150 Psalms. We're going to study every single one of the Psalms. And right now we're gonna look at Psalm 14. And so let's go right into Psalm 14. So a lot of scholars, they say that the Psalm actually has kind of two characteristics. In one sense, it looks like it's a lament, like the psalmist is lamenting something. But scholars will say that it really draws from the wisdom tradition of Israel, and it looks at the bad choices that people make. And so this psalm looks at the worst choice that a person can make, and that's to deny the existence of God. So let's start off. It says, to the choir master. It has a sense that the psalm is liturgical. And then it's a psalm of David. It's credited to David. Scholars, as I mentioned before, will say that it's not clear if it's by David or for David, like they were composing it for David. Um, but regardless, the tradition was is that David wrote a number of the Psalms. And so we assume that it was written by David. So let's start off the very first verse. It says, the fool says in his heart. You'll notice that this Psalm, Psalm 14, is close to Psalm 53. And it's not an accident that you have two Psalms that hearken at the worst thing that a person could do. It's like the Psalter is trying to say, please, whatever you do, never deny the existence of God. But it's more than denying the existence of God. It's denying a personal God, a God who loves us. And so the fool says in his, in his heart, there is no God. And so it starts off and it just says, of all the bad choices you could make, to actually deny the existence of a personal God who loves us, who has revealed himself to us. This is the worst choice you could ever make. And so the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And you know, really, this is a great psalm to share with somebody who's an atheist or an agnostic, not in a way to offend them. You have to, you share the psalm with them and you say that, you know, this comes from the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, and it's underlining that this is the worst choice that we can make, the worst decision that we could arrive at in our lives. And then when you look at the other Psalms, the other Psalms help us to understand all the trials and difficulties of the faith and how important it is to trust in God through those trials and difficulties. So many people in our modern world, they deny the existence of God because they go through trials and difficulties and they feel like there's no help. And so I think the other Psalms in the Psalter actually complement this Psalm and they help us to realize that when we are in the midst of trial, we must have what's called perseverance. And at that moment, our faith is being purified. So the fool says in his heart, there is no God, they are corrupt. Look what it says about those who deny the existence of a personal God who loves us. They are corrupt. The concept of being corrupt, it's a concept that's underlined before the flood. If you go to the flood narrative, if you go to the narrative about so Sodom and Gomorrah, the corrupt nature of humanity, it's, it's like a you could say a, um, a step that takes place before judgment. Uh, and so they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds, and there is none that does good. So of these fools who deny God, there's none that do, does good. And, you know, because they've denied the existence of a personal God who loves them, who is merciful, look at what happens to their moral life. And it's something that we have to share with people, that our faith in a personal God who loves us, who's revealed himself to us, it changes the way we live it complements the moral life that we live. And it, it constantly helps us to look at our moral life and reevaluate it. Whereas the one who has denied the existence of God, they have no way to evaluate their moral life. So if you look at some of the worst people that lived in the history of the world, you look at Stalin, you look at Hitler, you look at Mao Zedong, who killed millions of people. What's one thing they all have in common? The one thing they all have in common is they denied the existence of a personal God who loves us, who's merciful, who wants to, us to know him and who has revealed himself to us. And so you can see when you really read this Psalm, you, you can say, well, it's true. 
And then verse two, it says, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if, if there are any that act wisely, that seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike, corrupt. There is none that does good. No, not one. St. Paul used these words in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, to underline why every single person needs to repent. And how beautiful to see how he takes these words. And, you know, in context, it's talking about the fool. It's talking about those who persecute God's people. But Paul's trying to, he uses it in Romans chapter 3 to say, look, if we really believe in a personal God who loves us, and if we really want to recognize what has happened when the Father sent his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us, we will all turn away from our sins. We will acknowledge that we've sinned, and we will turn to the Lord and ask for forgiveness. And so Paul uses this phrase to help us understand how we need forgiveness. And so verse 4, um, have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread. It's talking about those who persecute the people of God. Notice how it starts with the fool, and then it goes to those who persecute the people of God. It's true. Those who deny the existence of a personal God who loves us, they will naturally persecute those who have faith, who serve our, who serve the Lord. And so it's, it, it's a natural thing that happens. And I would share this with any person who's an atheist. I would say it's just simply natural that those who are atheists and agnostics, they will persecute the people of faith. And you just go, I'll give you three examples. Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong. You got any questions? You want to challenge that? I don't think you can challenge that. And so it tells you something. If, if you, if you ha are a person of faith, you're going to constantly examine your life. You will constantly turn away from sin. And so look at what it says in verse five, they shall be in great terror for God is with the generation of the righteous. And so the great terror will come because one day God will come to judge the earth. And at that moment, all those who have denied the faith will realize the absolute horror of what they have done and what they have dedicated their lives to, which is a life of ungodliness. And at that moment, the righteous will be overwhelmed with joy because they will, they will realize God has truly vindicated those who are righteous. So verse six, it says, you would confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. So the fool who denies God and those who persecute God's people, they confound the plans of the poor but God is the refuge for the poor. And, and then in verse seven, there's a beautiful plea. You know, you can look at this Psalm in one sense and see that it's like a lament, but it's also, as many scholars will say, it in a very broad way reflects the wisdom tradition of Israel. And what's beautiful about this last verse is, look at the plea for God to come and change everything, to transform our world. And it says, oh, that deliverance for Israel would come out of Zion. And what's really interesting is that Zion could be a word that was used like a synonym for Jerusalem, but also a word that um, referred to God's heavenly dwelling place. And here it seems to refer to the Lord's heavenly dwelling place. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come out of Zion, that God would come forth from his heavenly temple and save his people. And look at what it says, when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, Israel shall be glad. And we wait for this one day, when Christ will return, when he will come forth from the heavenly Zion and the dead will be risen in glory and the Lord will restore in the fullest way the fortunes of his people. And we will truly rejoice in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.